misdirection plays a big role in that, controlling the narrative. A political candidate will be asked a question, let's say, in a debate. And instead of answering the question they're asked, they'll use misdirection, or if you want to call it direction, to switch and talk about something they feel is more interesting to their cause. So I don't, I don't have exact say, but I saw it on the debate the other night of both candidates, you know, pivoting to something that isn't related whatsoever to what they're talking about, but they can misdirect you from it by posing a question or switching topics. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing about democracy is that you don't have to misdirect everybody. You you only need to misdirect a huge bunch yeah, to win. Yeah, that's a wonderful thing. I guess wonderful if you're trying to get elected. What is the psychology of human attention? Can politicians subtly manipulate your mind through effective storytelling? Can false memories be imprinted in your head without you even knowing it? In some sense, the world we are living now is magical. And today's episode is magical. I have world-class magician Joshua J with us. He's the author of the book, How Magicians Think, which describes the philosophy of magic, how the mind can be easily deceived the art form of magic, and much more. As usual, I'm your host Raj and enjoy the conversation with Joshua on The Seeker's Mind Talks. Let's start there. Like, What's the magic of human attention? Like, How much of reality am I missing on a daily basis? Well, I guess that would depend on the person, how observant you are. And I encounter people when I do magic that really surprise me because mm -hmm. they just have some quality that they are immune to misdirection, that they see the world differently. They see through things and other people I perform for many, many people I perform for, uh, enjoy magic to the fullest and they experience that misdirection and they see things that they don't perceive. And that totally separately gives me such a feeling of fear because I realize how easily deceived we are. Now, mm -hmm. fortunately, I get to do the kind of deception that's purely to bring joy, purely for positive reasons. But what if my reasons for deceiving people were political or financial or religious? You know, it would be very different. Mm. I mean, is that totally possible? I mean, I see you when you wink a handkerchief, the human at least an average human mind, the attention goes to there for a moment and that's when you do your deception, right? That Everybody knows this. This is a mainstream story now and that's why you guys are updating every year, right? Yeah. And and, and you said that you, you fear some people as well, right? H how does that play out? Okay, so let's, let's first dispel a couple of things. Um, because, you know, I think magic is a lot more complex than your summary, which is okay. Uh, you're not supposed to know how magic works. Um, it's not simply that they flick a handkerchief and you look where they look. You're talking about misdirection. And misdirection has basically two parts to it, two categories of misdirection. One is physical misdirection. That's what you're talking about. It could be the flick of a handkerchief. It could be a beautiful assistant walking to the front of the stage and doing a twirl and then walking off. Your eyes are drawn to something visually. It could be a big animal. It could be a flash of fire. And that can cover some secret move. But the other kind of misdirection is mental misdirection. So if I ask you where you're from, or, sir, I would like you to think of any celebrity who's alive right now. If I ask you to do that, you relax. To access new information, we typically look up. Um, how about Brad Pitt? We have to think. And when you're thinking and answering a question, you are not watching me. You're not watching this hand. You're not watching what my toes are doing. You're not thinking about what I might be thinking about. You're trying to be responsive to the question. That's mental misdirection. So there's physical and there's mental misdirection. And I have to tell you, it's not anymore with a good magician. It's really not flicking a handkerchief or something as, as simple as that. It's much more complex and subtle things that we mm -hmm. might misdirect you with. Hmm. You, you were talking about the, I wanted to touch the, the political aspects as well. I mean, can, can this be used in an evil sense? Well, sure. 
It's used every day in an evil sense. The exact same tools and techniques that I use to entertain people can be used for terrible, um, for terrible. Wow, because you you guys would spot this, right? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, when people, when scientists are trying to detect fraud, they realize that they didn't have as much success when they were trying to detect like. Yuri Geller as a spoon bender or somebody able to stop the hands of a watch or somebody able to read minds. And magicians were often able to see through things that brilliant scientists could not. In the skeptic movement, magicians have been a great ally. And the reason is not that magicians are smarter than scientists, that they have a better background. It's that magicians are attuned to tools of deception, whereas scientists are not. And so there are certain telltale flagged signs that magicians' uh, alarms are set off about that wouldn't set off the alarms of, of normal people. Um, <clears throat> you know, when you take somebody at their word, all right, look, we're going to do something with a regular deck of cards now. Most people go, okay, you said it's regular. But is it regular? Did you look at it? Or when somebody says, look, I don't I don't want to come near you. Okay, but did you just come near them? Did you just touch the spoons before you bent them? When you say, here, we'll do it in your hands this time. Yes, but was it bent before you put it in my hands? There's so many ways you can manipulate somebody. But uh, does this happen in modern day media? Do, do you see this manipulation happening in some sort of digital form? Especially because we are living in information age and there's lot of this thing going around, right? Being thrown around. And there was a lot during the COVID time as well. Do, do you spot these kind of irregularities or? Well, you know? I try. <laughs> um, I'm not immune to being taken advantage of either. We all uh, have our blind spots. But I think on the whole, magicians are very attuned to these principles and the things that that they're used for. And so I think magicians are, are quite enlightened, some magicians, um, when it comes to those things. Mm -hmm. I, as somebody who spends their life on stage, a great deal of my time is spent thinking about showmanship, thinking about rhetoric, thinking about communicating an idea. And so when I see political candidates, when I see anybody speaking in public trying to convince somebody of anything, you can really divide it very neatly into two categories. One would be the quality of their ideas. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the quality of how they're presenting those ideas. Mm -hmm. And I see techniques from politicians I vehemently disagree with where I think, wow, that was so convincingly conveyed or wow, I see what he's doing here. Misdirection plays a big role in that controlling the narrative. Well, okay. Would you be able to give an example? Sure. Let me think of uh, a good example. Well, um, you know, to come back to what we were talking about, misdirection, you know, I told you has physical and, and mental misdirection. But there was a great magician named Tommy Wonder who talked about that he didn't like the term misdirection because misdirection makes it seem as if you're drawing somebody's attention away from something. Look here, look at this phone, look over here, look at this phone. They don't want you to see what's over here. But he talked about direction as a better example. So mm -hmm. in direction, you're constantly trying to give somebody something very interesting to focus on. And just as an example that you asked for in the political sphere, it's so interesting to me that a political candidate will be asked a question, let's say, in a debate. And instead of answering the question they're asked, they'll use misdirection, or if you want to call it direction, to switch and talk about something they feel is more interesting to their cause. So I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have exact say, but I saw it on the debate the other night of both candidates, you know, pivoting to something that isn't related whatsoever to what they're talking about, but they can misdirect you from it by posing a question or switching topics. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing about democracy is that you don't have to misdirect everybody. You you only need to misdirect a huge bunch. 
yeah, to win. Yeah, call that the wonderful thing. I guess wonderful if you're trying to get elected uh, in an underhanded way. But yes, I know what you mean. Uh, so, so do do you see that? You said that there are some people who it's very hard to misdirect them, right? And you're scared of them. Do you feel that their attention is sort of the same as yours? Because you see this, you know, you you try to think how the audience thinks, and and you you. you know where the misdirection is happening but you train your attention 24/7 and it's your whole career to not to look at those subtle things that are drawing you do you see any uh, comparison or similarities well the first part of your question is it will tackle first it's interesting to me because just like the point you just made in a democracy you're not going after 100% of the people you're going after most of the people So magic similarly there are principles in magic that are going to work on most people but that won't work on absolutely everybody. I mean there are anomalies in every audience. There are people, you know, most of us look at the other person's mouth when they talk and we have good eye contact. But there are certain people, we all know these people who don't look at your eyes at all. They look down when they talk. They don't look where you're going to look or some people are able to do a lot of things at once and other people are they cannot focus on two things at once so if i'm a performer and i'm talking and i'm explaining that in a moment we're going to have you choose a card and you are going to choose any number but to some people they just stare at a deck of cards on the table they won't look away from it because they can only manage one thing at a time they don't listen to anything else and that can really throw off a magician not always but sometimes um so you know it's interesting to me when people have different social rhythms because it makes what i do more challenging hmm have you had circumstances where people call you out i mean over the years somewhat but again as a professional it's my job to deal with that um fortunately mm-hmm. now i'm working in theaters and and the kinds of places where it's really not appropriate for somebody to act like a an 8 year old child and say <laughs> i saw that or you know but you deal with it and you you try as best you can huh what is the uh, can we talk about the psychology of human attention sure what would you like to talk about <laughs> we talked about a little bit about um, deception and i was also reading going through your books and saw this idea of uh, memory implantation Yeah. You you plant false memories, and that got me fascinated, right? Because you are you are getting into the mind of another person and making them believe something. That's you're creating an illusion, basically. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is recaps. You can have so much fun when you recap a series of events. So, in one of the tricks that I do, I say to somebody. Um, shuffle the cards and they shuffle the cards and then i take them back and i say i'm going to make a prediction and i take one of the cards out and i put it on the table face down and i say from this moment on i'm not going to touch the cards and i give the deck to somebody else now i make the trick happen and the trick that I, the card that i predict matches the card that they pick but that's a good trick if i want it to be an absolutely unbelievable trick i want to change the memory very slightly so that the order of events is not i give you a deck to shuffle i take it back i make a prediction then i don't touch it i want the order of events to be i made a prediction then you shuffled and i didn't touch the deck so the way that i do that is i recap and i say in the middle of the trick now remember this prediction's been on the table the entire time you shuffled the deck now those two separate things are true prediction on the table you shuffle the deck but they are not ordered and i don't say they're ordered but then at the second recap two more minutes later i say remember i put a prediction on the table at the beginning then you shuffle the deck i didn't touch anything well now i've changed the order in a way that when people remember they say oh yeah he had a prediction on the table they shuffle the deck and he didn't touch it after that i remember that you're misremembering what you think you saw Wow, is it because we basically trust everybody? Is is trust a basic core human instinct there? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Uh. Um, it's it is a big part of it and you know not everybody is an equal amount of trusting and some people are skeptical 
but it's what they're skeptical about that makes a big difference. Sometimes they're skeptical about things that don't matter, but sometimes they're skeptical about things that do matter. That's that's really interesting and intriguing as well. Uh, you you've done uh, academic papers. You've written academic papers on magic as well, right? I was researching and uh, I was reading that you went to this new New Jersey neuroscience, right? Of New Jersey, yeah. I saw this story that you were giving a lecture to the students there and you were talking about this book, Sites of Magic, and they came up with incredibly, incredible questions that really were in the boundaries that really made you question as well. What, what were there, those questions? Well, they were asking questions that nobody knew the answer to, like, are tricks remembered better at the beginning or the end of a performance? We don't know. We mm. didn't know until we did this test. They ask questions like, are there certain cards that are more likely to be thought of than others? Well, I mean, magicians have their opinions, but we don't know. So we did the tests on these things. We asked, what role does an introduction play in magic? In other words, if you see performer A and they just say, please watch Joshua J do a magic trick. And then you watch group B watches and they say, Please watch world champion magician Joshua J perform one of the most difficult tricks in all of magic. Well, I think those those people are going to watch those performances a little differently in a different frame of mind. So it's very interesting to me to test out these different tricks. So I was hired to speak at this college and tell them, you know, all about concepts in magic. But I realized on that day that there were many things I did not know. And so I partnered with uh, one of the scientists there, and we did a study that was eventually published in the pages of Magic Magazine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, like, how is the landscape of magic changing now? Um, I think that the most noticeable way that magic is changing is that most magic is digested online now. And mm -hmm. that... That's a really shocking thing for me to say, that most people watch their magic on TikTok and Instagram and, and other sources like that. It's, uh, it's a big change. Um, some people are trying to use AI for magic. I have no doubt that that will increase in the future. Um, wow. And tricks are getting more modern. You know, they're using phones, they're using modern uh, themes. And and you are known to be creative. Like, how, how does one use AI for magic? Well, um, I do create a lot of magic, but I'm the wrong guy to ask about that. I'm a Luddite when it comes to those things. I, I have peer-reviewed some tricks that people have created using AI, but I create much more from the heart. I'm thinking through the ideas and, and thinking more about dreaming what would be possible than trying to create magic. Yeah, I was on, on that note I was I was looking up into you and I saw that you you made uh, magic for blind people that's so much empathy man. Like yeah. nobody has looked into that field. Yeah, it was really exciting and and that came about because I live in New York right across the street from the largest blind center uh, in the city. So there were these people every day uh, crossing the street in my bagel shop, walking across the street where I get ice cream from. And they're, they're people who don't see. So you help them cross the street, you chat with them. Some live in my building. And I realized these people have never experienced a traditional magic trick. It's like a painting in a museum. They've, they've not seen that painting or watching a sunset. They just haven't experienced that. So I wondered what could I show them that would give them the experience of magic. And that's how my trick Out of Sight was born. Hmm. Going back, uh, you were talking about how we perceive when when we say it's a normal person or a world famous magician and that, that your brain is in creating that image inside your head and you're self priming yourself, right? And And that feeling sort of multiplies the experience that you're having. And it makes me wonder like, uh, we love to live more in illusions than reality. How, how true is that statement? <laughs> well, I mean, again, I, I can't speak to whole groups of people with those kind of generalities. I, I can only tell you that some people 
live uh, quite an enlightened life where they can enjoy magic and embrace mystery, but not give up their sense of logic, which is really mm -hmm. important, right? I, I would take it as a sign of stupidity if somebody loved magic so much and was totally uncurious as to how anything in the world works. You don't want to be friends with somebody like that. But on the other hand, it's no fun with somebody who I perform for who cannot live not knowing, right? You want people who embrace that they're not supposed to know. Oh, yeah. We all cry when we watch movies, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, we know they're just movies, but we still cry. And that's the magic part about it. Amazing. Uh, what's this? Hmm, what's this feeling of awe that has to do with magic? Well, there's a lot of science now about the the feeling and the inducement of awe. And I love to read about that. But in terms of my field and what awe is, we call awe astonishment. And there's a great magician in the 70s, 80s, and 90s named Paul Harris. And he talked about true astonishment as one of the most enlightened and important feelings that you can give. So astonishment occurs the moment you see something that you can't explain. Before your rational mind sets in and says, okay, wait a minute, that's my dollar bill and it's floating. But I did hand it to him beforehand and I, I, although I don't see any strings, maybe there are strings small enough to float a bill. Maybe there's a magnet inside. Before any of that occurs, when you start with your rational mind trying to rationalize and, and figure out what you saw, before that occurs, there's a moment. Sometimes it's just an inhale. Of, oh, sometimes it's, What? And that moment is pure astonishment. Mm. And that's a beautiful moment. People say that it's our most childlike state, that when we see that moment, oh, that is oneness. That is true stillness. Because you're not thinking about how it can be done. You're just watching something you know is not possible. Have, have you had any awe magic experience, right, which you were not able to still explain oh all the time i love to be fooled i love to be fooled um so it will be uh yeah i mean it happens to me all the time i can't i can't even uh give you so i mean i was just in spain with a magician named danny de ortiz one of the great magicians in uh in the world and we were just jamming, which is the term magicians use for I do a trick, then you do a trick. And I say, oh, yeah, that, that move is cool. Have you tried doing it like that? You know, you're, you're sort of watching, but you're also talking as you watch. And he did a trick for me, and it just fooled me so completely. It was wonderful. I, I didn't want to know. I just loved it. Wow. Making an, a magician at all is a completely different thing because you know all the tricks and the nooks and corners and still yeah. if you if you are getting deceived that's a whole different ball game right yeah yeah you 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 would have read tons and tons of books about magic and that's literally in your blood and have you had any experience of a magic that was like really really magic that's unexplainable um, in my book i talk about this story of sea turtles uh -huh. i'll tell you this what happened to me is the moment I thought I really saw real magic. Um, everybody said when I was in Ecuador, you need to go to La Isla Misteriosa. And I thought, okay, well, what's that? What's going to be there? And they said, don't look, just go. And it's not an island, but it's near the coast. So I show up at this parking lot and I wait in line. And when it's my turn, this kid comes out of the woods and he's a shaman. But when I say shaman, you think, you know, shaman. But actually, he's a kid in a hoodie and jeans. He's like 14 years old. And you pay him a nominal fee. He walks you through this forest, walking, walking. All of a sudden, the forest opens up to a clearing, and there's sun everywhere. And I don't know where I am. I wouldn't be able to find my way back. And then we walk up to the top of this mountain. And I look down, and everywhere is just turquoise water, be beautiful ocean. And he takes this rattle, and he shakes this rattle. And he says some kind of incantation. Out in the water, a sea turtle rises to the top exactly where he's pointing. I was <laughs> totally fooled. And then he shakes the rattle and he names it at another place. And another sea turtle comes up. And then he does it in two different places. And two sea turtles come up. 
And I thought, okay, I know how this is done. They're trained sea turtles. But then I realized that's ridiculous. The whole ocean is out there. And I thought, okay, they're netted in. Somehow they're stuck inside. But there's no net. I could see to the bottom. And then I thought, somebody down below, maybe his brother or sister, is throwing food to the sea turtles and they come up. But it wasn't that. And after all those solutions were exhausted, I realized I am completely, totally fooled. I don't know how it's done. Even more than that, I don't know that this trick has a secret. Maybe it's the real thing. So the curious magician in me, I said, I have to watch this trick again. So I hid behind a bush and I waited until they repeated the trick. And I watched it a second time. I shook the rattle, and sea turtles came up, and I was fooled a second time. And I thought, this is truly amazing. And as I was sitting there watching the horizon line, the sun, and my eyes went down to the surface of the water, I thought, man, I do magic all my life, but this is the first time I have been fooled by something I've I've seen so completely that I think it might be real. And that's when I saw it. Sea turtles coming up, going down, coming up, going down. These sea turtles weren't magic. They were sea turtles. That's what they do. They come up for air, they go down for air. This This shaman had figured out that he can use misdirection, he can claim responsibility for something that the sea turtles were doing naturally, and that makes for a great magic trick. Wow. Is it weird that I just hit a deja vu moment? Like you explaining the story? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny. Yeah. Uh, I tell the, the story in my book, so maybe you, you read it in my book, or I tell it in my podcast. I had a limited series. Yeah, I did. I did read the story in your book, but uh, it it hit on a different level. Like you explaining it to me and that picturizing part. I knew yeah. that I re- read it. I had already read the story. I knew that, but a deja vu moment just hit, and I was wow. just sitting there. <laughs> it's a glitch <laughs> matrix. <laughs> Do you believe that we are in a simulation? No. 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 Do you? I mean, we are empty space. If you ask me, if you if you look at my hand, it's made of atoms, and atoms are ninety nine point nine nine empty space, and they are just spawning out from actually nothingness. And we have far more questions that we don't have answers to than not. So why not? I'm open to it. <laughs> I'm not completely dismissive of the statement, but it's it's a uh, at this point I see this as a game. Yeah. but a really good game uh-huh. like a really really good immersive game that's a good 60 odd years to play wow 60 70 80 odd years which diverts me to the next question uh like you you've seen the movie prestige right yeah do you have a lifelong trick that's planned no where i kill my uh secret twin every show um No, I don't have uh I don't have one ambition. My main ambition now is I'm trying to create a trick, uh a show, I should say, not just a trick, a whole mm-hmm. experience in my home that I can have guests pay to come into my home and experience uh a totally unique magic immersive show. So we'll see. It's amazing because I think it was there was this another magic movie with the four horsemen right what was that called uh, horse yeah uh the best the magic se- movie ever made is hugo have you seen that one hugo oh no but i'm going to see Martin it now. scorsese's hugo you must watch it really uh, great i was trying to remember this movie in the second part there was daniel radcliffe and uh, rimon but Yeah in that movie they they do talk about a trick in which a guy when he was like 12 years old he saw a tree that was like half cut and he hid a card five of heart inside the tree and after like 30 years the tree kind of grew around it Oh you're talking about now you see me too I yeah, think Yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you should do those kind of tricks man Okay <laughs> No uh, Are there people who do that that kind of lifelong trick in a, I mean, tri- oh, a lifelong trick i don't know i mean there was a guy named david burgless from the uk who was known for um 
he was known for doing tricks that required an unbelievable amount of backstory and and work. Where can people uh, connect with you and find you? Uh, on social media. Instagram is probably the easiest. Well, that was magician Joshua Jay sharing his experience about the world of magic on the Seekers Mind Talks. If you want to get in touch with him, I'll leave you all the links below. If you enjoyed the show, please do support us and watch our other videos as well. As usual, I'm your host Raj and until next time, signing off from the Seekers Mind Talks.